recently. I, really? So you just blinked for a second. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah there's, the, there's the button up in the corner that says, you're recording the call. I'm glad Skype finally changed that. Uh, yeah, you yeah. can use the in Skype recording option, but there's a button. Yeah, you'll probably see it. There, there's a little red dot that says, oh, yeah, just so you know, mm-hmm, yeah. some nefarious types are recording the whole thing. Yeah. At that point, I say, Chris types is a good description for Carter and I. I think. Here's where all the bodies are buried. Yeah. <laughs> That's everything to you. And alrighty. Uh, so, I mean, we were kind of uh, wanted to, for the interview, to, to begin by asking to sort of describe the, uh, the notion of the flat Earth model that you subscribe to and sure. to give a brief rundown of a few of the other sort of popular flat Earth uh, models. Sure. So my name is Mark Sargent, and I subscribe to the domed, enclosed world model, that the world is not some little speck of dust that's flying through an impossible universe. It is a building with walls and a floor and a ceiling, and that it is roughly, I don't know, just from from the inner edges, maybe 20,000 miles across. The dome could be up to 3,000 miles high. And we have no idea what's outside of it, but you can just throw space out the window. And that's what myself and a lot of other flat earthers believe in. Um, And I usually, if you saw the documentary, it's maybe 70-30 to where the other 30% also believe in a flat world, you know, flat circular world, not globular, uh, globular, globular uh, world, but, uh, but it doesn't have a dome on it, mm-hmm. in which case they'd still run into the problem of gravity versus uh, the vacuum of space. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? And, uh, yeah, so to sort of, if, uh, to, yeah, give a sort of description of sort of some of the others, I, uh, Oh yeah, those are, those are the two big ones. It's usually, I mean, it really comes down to two, two big houses, which is, uh, glow, uh, enclosed dome or no dome. Mm-hmm. Dome, where again, it's just a um, you know a dinner plate world with a with a dome over the top of it. Where the other one, they call it kind of the infinite plane, mm-hmm. where it just goes on and on and on. And it's like okay, but again, but you're still going to have to deal with space. And those are the two big ones. I, I mean, there's some fringe ones out there like concave Earth, where they think the you know it's actually you know curved upwards. Uh, severely, but th- that's pretty fringe even for us. And then, of course, the really, really fringe, with the, which the media loves grabbing onto, or people says that it's a, a dinner plate that's actually flying upwards through space mm-hmm. at nine meters per second per second, which is mm-hmm. silly. I don't know anyone that actually believes in that. Yeah. But that takes into account, it's like, oh, well, that's what gravity is. Mm-hmm. It's like, nah, I don't think so. So mm-hmm. those are those are the ones that are out there. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay. And uh, already, um, so uh, we're comedians, and we yeah. like to ask some pretty, like, funny questions. And yeah. you, can, to... <laughs> you can ask whatever. Seriously, the, after the amount of interviews I've done, I it, if you can ask me something original, it would thrill me. Okay, let's okay. Have, this one's original. Yeah, I okay. think so. <laughs> um, yeah, once in a while, we're gonna throw in a funny one. Okay, okay. you mentioned uh, uh, the ice wall is like the one in Game of Thrones when you're yeah. in the documentary. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, do you believe that the only way to get through this ice wall would be with an ice dragon? No, oh, that's good. By the way, um, <laughs> since you mentioned Game of Thrones, uh, first off, I, I've got to tell you, the, the last season was the biggest train wreck slash dumpster. <laughs> <fight. laughs> Absolutely. It so was disappointing. horrifyingly bad. Oh and and of course, once I figured out that they ran out of original book material and that the producers were just kind of making it up on their own, it made a lot more sense because those particular producers were not writers. They were just like, and it's like, oh yeah, we're going to finish the whole season in what, six episodes or something like yeah. that? It's like, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> not not cleanly. <laughs> uh, no, no, an ice dragon, no. In fact, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that because the ice wall, that's what a lot of people think, well, that's the end of the earth. And it's not. Uh, for us, the ice wall is just a beginning. That's just the coastline of Antarctica. Most of the coastline of Antarctica is not even close to being as high high as the Game of Thrones. But that Game of Thrones wall was 300 feet at least, whereas most of it, most of the the coastline is at 150 feet roughly. And but what's interesting is is that the entire continent, at least even what mainstream science describes, goes up much much higher. Most of the continent sits at about fourteen thousand feet. You know, it's uh, it's like a it's like a high, high, not even desert. It's this high ice plateau, and then there are higher points that go over twenty thousand feet, which means you know altitude sickness kicks in around seven thousand feet. I'm not going to convert to meters for you guys. Yeah. I'm American, and the uh, same thing with Celsius and Fahrenheit and all that stuff. We're American. <laughs> we, don't do, we don't do that. 
or in uh, the USA as well. <laughs> and the um, uh, so the whole place is just screams go away. Human beings are not meant to be there in any capacity. So no, no ice dragon. Ice dragon. I actually like the ice dragon concept, but my god, they butchered it at the end. Yeah, I know. Uh, oh, it's still terrible. Anyway. <laughs> just briefly from that, so you mentioned that it's sort of not the end. Um, so, so sort of how much further beyond oh, thousands of miles at least. And by that, I'm the reason why I use that. And if you watch the clues at all was that Admiral Byrd, you know, the United States, um, the youngest Admiral ever in the United States Navy, he spent the rest of his career flying, uh, exploratory missions out in Antarctica, better part of 30 years up until his death in 1957, just doing circles, flew his own planes around there. So if the, the Antarctic coastline is the beginning of the white, <laughs> Then the you know the the outer barrier the outer marker has got to be thousands several thousand miles inland, um, and that makes sense because you know if you if you're looking for the better part of thirty years and you cannot find it with your own planes and you know and we're talking military guys, you know with a lot of resources unlimited resources he started in 1928 again and flew all the way up until 1957. Uh, then it, it goes a long, long way. And that makes sense because you would want, if you built this place, you don't want to make the Antarctic coastline, you know, the end, end of the world. I mean, you're going to put it far, far inland. And we're talking about on a continent with no indigenous plant life, no animal life. Uh, the penguins on the coast don't count. Uh, you're not going to eat those all the time. And uh, no indigenous population. So what you take with you on your on your journey, that's it. And so, yeah, it, the whole thing is just one giant negative reinforcement, it, and which is very, very clever because you at some point during this journey are going to turn back yourself. It's not like yeah, you have, again, we'll use a Game of Thrones reference. Yeah. It's not like you have giant, you know, f giant frost people standing there with axes, you know, saying "Go away," because that's not going to turn anybody away. Yeah. People are like, "Oh, how can we get past those guys?" The climate, the conditions are so bad that eventually it's like, "Man, this sucks. We're going back," mm -hmm. and that's what everybody did, uh, except for Adm Admiral Byrd. Mm -hmm. Okay, alrighty. Okay, so uh, we're gonna ask some questions about you. Um, yeah. In the documentary, you said you, you're really into conspiracy theories. Yep. Uh, what was the first conspiracy theory you kind of got into? JFK. Yeah, well, yeah. you know, okay. When I was really young, growing up in the Northwest, we've all heard about Bigfoot and stuff like that because that's in the Northwest. And British Columbia, actually, is um, – uh, Vancouver Island is, has the, the highest sightings of anywhere. It's not even the United States. It's it's Vancouver Island. Go figure. Um but yeah, JFK, that was the big one because remember, this was before the internet, quite, quite a number of years before the internet. And JFK came out in the theaters in um, the early 90s, and I saw it in the theater, and it was done so well. The blending, if you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. The blending of real footage with Oliver Stone's footage in that it blurred reality. And uh, I mean, a lot of people, it was a sold out showing, I remember that opening weekend, and people came out of that theater angry. It was like they bought it. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> there's no way, you know, a lone gunman did this. Yeah. And I at that time, I grew up, you know, I grew up on a, a very rural, isolated island that was very sheltered. And I didn't think that people in authority ever lied. It's like, <laughs> why, why would anyone lie, you know, at high, at high levels? And then after seeing that, it's like, oh, OK, it's possible. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of started me down the road of, OK, what else could you lie about? And I got into just about every conspiracy theory you can. I have an opinion on every conspiracy you can think of. And I liked some. I didn't like others. And Flat Earth was the last one I looked at because why would I look at it at all? It's terrible. It's an awful thing. But yeah, it turns out to be the most uh, mind-blowing one if you can get your head around it. Yeah. And so uh, from that, could we ask, um, what's a, an example of a notable sort of – uh, a conspiracy theory with sort of pop cultural awareness that you actually don't believe. That I don't believe in. Um, well, I mean, they're the obvious ones. Like, is Elvis Presley still alive? Usually it's one of those. No, no, uh, no, I don't think that. Um, there's one that changed for me, and that is aliens. How's that? Um, UFOs. In fact, one of the, the finest UFO say, sightings, uh, remind me and I'll send you a clip of it, is actually, go figure, it was in Oak Bay, which is right up in um, uh, near Victoria. Uh, do I, I used to believe that aliens, I always believed in something, you know, that there's something flying around there. I've seen it myself, buy some night vision binoculars, you'll just blow your, blow your head off because it'll be like, oh my God, there's so many things up there that you cannot see with the naked eye. 
Um, and I used to think it's okay. They're they're from other planets, you know, Mars and Jupiter and Venus. I don't think that anymore. Whatever they are, I think they're either in here with us, mm -hmm. and they're just older. They're older versions of us, um, or they are from other snow globe, other buildings, and they can go back and forth. Although I don't like that one as much. I like to think they're just older versions of us that are trapped here with us. Maybe subterranean. Uh, maybe another dimension, but they're definitely not from Mars and Jupiter and Venus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, another personal question. Uh, what are some of your interests that are like outside of conspiracies or like yeah. flat earth? Uh, all things media. I absorb so much media. Uh, um, movies, huge, huge movie fan, huge science fiction fan. Uh, although I have guilty pleasure movies as well. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you want me to name off of you? Oh, no, no, oh, sure. Oh. One or two. <laughs> uh, guilty, guilty pleasure movies. Uh, let's see. Sky High by mm -hmm. Disney. Oh, yeah. that's, a, that's a fun one. <laughs> yeah. I'm, a, I'm a big superhero fan. Uh, Scott Pilgrim. I, oh, I think yeah. that's one of the most underrated movies ever. Uh, uh, right. uh, Edgar Wright, the director, just amazing. Yeah. Um, Bring It On. <laughs> because my sister was a cheerleader uh, okay. and and I remember going and seeing it. it's like oh this could be fun and and uh I think I was the, like the only guy in there with a, like just tons and tons of groups of cheerleaders and I felt <laughs> really weird when I when I saw that um but let's see uh basketball windsurfing video games huge video game guy I still have my Warcraft account after 14 going on 15 years um, and I was one of those guys that I only played, so I, I didn't play everything. I didn't play a lot of console games. It was mostly PC. And so like if Warcraft was my wife, then Fallout 3 would have been my mistress. Okay. Okay. I, I, just, I just love those games to death. But, I, but then I still have my guilty pleasure games. Yeah. Uh, two, two notable ones would be Plants vs. Zombies, which I think was one of the most wonderful strategic defensive things ever. And then silly games like Bejeweled 3. Oh. Which I, I still, you know, I'm sad that PopCap got bought out. But so, anyway, does that give you kind of an idea of where yeah. I am? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so um, another question is, um, is we were curious what you, how you felt about uh, the way that uh, Behind the Curve actually displays yourself and the Flat Earth community at large. I had mixed feelings because... I, okay, first off, I you know I can't be completely objective because I you know shot I helped shoot the thing for seven months. Uh, however, and and I predict everything I predicted pretty much came true, which was I said, look, the Flyers community is going to hate it, <laughs> but the globalists are going to be really interested in it, and uh, even the producers and the director and the editors, they were they were most most films in Hollywood don't go anywhere. In fact, I'll give you a quick idea of how hard it is to get a film into anything. Uh, for the Toronto Film Festival that year, there were 3,000 submissions. Mm -hmm. Out of those, they only took 100. Mm -hmm. And out of those, maybe if you make it into the top 10, you get bought. You get, you get bought out. And they said, well, we're never going to make it into the top 10. Well, first of all, they didn't even think they were going to get, you know, they, they entered in all these film festivals and they accepted by pretty much everything they ever submitted to. We did um, 27 film festivals in eight countries, which was amazing. And then they said, well, nobody's going to buy it. Right. And then like iTunes picks it up immediately and then YouTube Red, and then Google and then Amazon and then finally Netflix. And when Netflix got it, I did not realize that everybody under the age of 30 has Netflix. But you know, <laughs> yeah. And that's that's when it just exploded. That's yeah. that's when. Um, so what happened was, I got the chance to go to some of these film festivals in different places, uh, not only here but in Canada. And I saw the same thing every time, which was, it became kind of like a Trojan horse for us. Yeah, of course. You know, the the Flyers community hated it because we don't like hearing dissenting voices. So when we see a scientist and a psychologist and an astronaut up on screen, we're like, you know, raging. It's like, oh, we hate you. Uh, but at the same time, it really there were so many people that had questions afterwards. I mean, our membership just kept growing and growing and growing. It was just jet fuel uh, for us. Uh, and so, but would I have changed anything in the film? Yeah, I, I would have changed the ending. Uh, for on with what they did with Jaron, uh, even though Jaron botched the experiment horribly twice, uh, the director you get people don't know unless you're in the industry or are in some sort of film production, you don't know the power of editing. 
power of editing is so amazing what you can do. Like, uh, for example, the green button incident with me, which was when they, they zoomed in the green button and made it seem like I never touched it. Uh-huh. And all they had to do, and that was just an accident. You know, they were just waited for we for us. If you shoot any scenes, you know, you wait for the people to, to leave the scene and you keep your camera moving. You know, that way you have a nice splice for the editing. And they had it on the green button. And somebody just thought, hey, what if we just take out the part where he hit the button in the first place? We'll make him look like he missed the obvious. And they did. And they apologized to me during the screening. But at the same time, they never took it back. And I suppose I could have had him remove it. But I was like, oh, that was a good shot. Why not? But the, the thing with Jaren, I think it was unfair, even though Jaren um, made their lives inconvenient because he had them fly up to San Francisco to do this test twice. And he botched it, you know, horribly both times. Uh, that that's probably the only thing I would change. But like, but, but it didn't matter. So they were trying to make that. Here, let me. I gotta get this across. Mm-hmm. Where at the end they were trying to make it like a statement, but people forget that by the time you get to the end of that film, if you've never seen anything about flat Earth, you've done a hundred minutes of mm-hmm. of pretty much uncut flat Earth. And by the time they got there, <laughs> almost almost nobody in that theater even knew what went wrong. Only that something went wrong. Uh-huh. And in fact, I, I talked because I talked to all these people outside. I go, I'd asked them, I go, so do you know what happened at the end? They go, no, but it was bad, right? Mm-hmm. I go, yeah, it was bad. Do you know what was bad about it? They go, no, I have no idea. Mm-hmm. In fact, I even talked to flat earthers. They said the same thing. They didn't even know because it's tough. Um, l- let me l- let me throw this one more thing and then you can get to your next question, which is the reason why flat earth, why you're talking to me and why everybody's been talking about this is because we've created a model that is easier to explain to people than the globe. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, I'm not saying that the populate, the general public is dumb. I'm not saying that. What they have done, though, is they have digested a lot of junk food media. People know a lot of things. I mean, there's people that memorize quarterback ratings for just about everybody in the NFL. And they can tell you all the freaking cast members on Game of Thrones and, oh, just about every (laughs) movie that Tom Cruise has ever been in. But if you try to say, oh, yeah, by the way, who's the 23rd president of the United States? <laughs> no idea. In fact, you could out of the 50 presidents we've had, roughly, they might be able to name five and they probably have to look through their wallet for him. <laughs> and they probably and in fact, they probably pick Ben Franklin as one of them. It's like, no, no, he's on the hundred dollar bill, but he's not a president. He's just a guy. Yeah. Anyway, so cool. sorry, yeah. I ramble. <laughs> um. So, you know, next up, we actually had heard that you'd, uh, you know, spent, you're pretty interested in, in video games uh, before we actually came to this interview. And we kind of got talking about what we each thought your favorite uh, video game would be. Okay. And so, um, so we're going to have to, like, at least between the two of yeah. us who said, you know, so my argument that must is that it must be that it's Minecraft because you can ultimately, it has a, an area where you can build any illusion you want. And it's a very much a clearly flat plane, you know, it goes on. Yeah. All right. Well, let me let me respond to that really quick. <laughs> when Minecraft came out, I was horrified because because it went backwards. And you got to remember, games up until that point, games have always moved forward in terms of graphics. Mm-hmm. They've always gotten shinier, and all the water's better, and the shadowing is better, and you know all this one stuff. And then all of a sudden, Minecraft Minecraft came out. It's like it's, it's it wasn't even like eight bit. It was like four bit graphics. I'm going. Why are they doing this? Why, why, why are kids latching onto this? I didn't know at that point. I realized I was old. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Minecraft was a wonderful example of how all video games are made in a flat world. Computers don't do circles. Most people don't know that. A pixel is square or a rectangle. Um, and that is, you ask a computer to draw a circle, you can't do it. Computers cannot do it. You have to tell them. It's like you have to just draw tiny, tiny, tiny right angles. Um, so no, Minecraft just, it, for me, it was a novelty game, meaning I was, if, if, if I had to go back in time, I would immediately call the makers of Lego. I'd call the Lego corporation and I'd say, you've got to go over to wherever Switzerland or wherever that guy is who, who built it and just grab, dump him uh, like briefcases of money and buy the rights and put it under the Lego brand and you've got it. You've got the whole thing. It, it makes sense at that point. Yeah. Uh, but no, every time I watch, oh, I'm sorry. The other reason I don't like Minecraft is because of PewDiePie. Oh, oh God. Plain and simple. He's entire rise to internet culture other than, of course, buying subs and hits, which I don't even want to get into that much, is that his first video was literally him laughing at a Minecraft zombie stuck in a Minecraft tree. 
that was it. I mean, that was the first video he ever did. And, and he's like, he wasn't even talking. He was just laughing about this zombie getting stuck in the tree. I'm going, this thing gets 8 million hits. What the hell? I mean, there's nothing happening there. But again, that actually helped Minecraft even get bigger to where I, I get it. It's super creative. You know, people can build stuff, but there's other world building things out there. I just, I'm a big fan of huge graphics. I mean, I'm talking to you on a 34 inch ultra wide monitor and I'm thinking of upgrading to a 38. I like big, <laughs> super graph key stuff. Okay. All right. So uh, my pitch here would be that your favorite video game would be GTA 5 because it's essentially uh, just a, like a small map. But if you try to go too far outside of it, you just hit like a wall and then you can't uh, escape the map. I have an opinion on GTA. Uh, when it came out, especially the latest one, uh, I took I had friends that were saying, "You got to play it." Graphic, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous yeah. game. Yeah. Um, in fact, I did a video. Uh, it was a compilation video. How I was talking about simulation theory and the double slit experiment, and how G and they used GTA as an example, which was great. And that is, you know, when you're doing stuff in Street A, nothing happens on Street B. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's literally nothing there. It's just mathematical probabilities. Yeah. It's, there's literally no, nothing being drawn. You know, the whole double double slit experiment answers the question of a tree falls in the woods uh, doesn't and nobody's there to, to hear it doesn't make a sound. No, it doesn't because the tree hasn't been drawn. There's no reason to draw the tree. It's just lazy programming. Um, mm -hmm. So it's inefficient programming, I should say. But the reason why I didn't play GTA 5 or really any of the GTA stuff was the same reason I stopped playing Carmageddon, which goes back before you guys, which was uh, GTA is about crime. And I hate to say that I'm some sort of Boy Scout, but uh, this will give you an example. In Warcraft, I only play Alliance, and I only play Paladins, and I only uh, play Human. So okay. it's a good versus evil thing for me. So having GTA where you can, you know, you know, I'm sorry, the, the, the whole title of it, like your carjack, the carjacking is in the title. You know, a felony. You know, <laughs> doing a felony is is the title of the game. It's like, nah, nah, I, I won't, I won't do it. It's, uh, I'm sorry. There's some some things I do think it sets a bad example. Even yeah. though I'm talking to you about flat Earth, I don't think it's necessarily criminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely not. And um, what are you saying? <laughs> uh, so, so uh, one thing you're running is like, how do you actually respond to people who immediately sort of flat out reject flat Earth? without actually taking a look, uh, taking the time to sort of hear the arguments and look at the evidence that you put forward? Um, that is what I absolutely I expect. It's, it's not, it doesn't shock me at all. That is the norm. I mean, I've been doing this now for four years and it was the same reaction that I had. There was a knee jerk reaction. What I tell people is like, when I looked at my very first Flat Earth video, uh, what, just as I was clicking on it, I had a visceral response to it. I actually got flushed. I got embarrassed to click on it, which was weird. I was in a house by myself in Boulder, Colorado with the wind, with the drapes pulled, right? <laughs> There's nobody around. And I'm getting embarrassed. Like, what, what, what the hell happens? Like, look, I've been on the internet for 20 something years. I've seen a lot of weird stuff that would embarrass <laughs> a lot of people out there. We've all clicked on things we shouldn't be clicking on, but the, but flat earth, there's no reason this should happen. And so there was a knee jerk response to it. And uh, the example I've been giving to people lately is this, um, and this will make sense for Canadians as well as Americans, which is in the corner of the classroom, you have an American flag and it sits there, you know, if you go through high school, 12 years. And at the end of those 12 years, people develop sort of this attachment to the flag. Uh, and that is, you know, in fact, there's a lot of kids that get out of high school and they'll go straight into the military partially because that flag has been sitting in front of them for 12 years. Well, right below the flag usually is a globe. So what's the difference? Not much. You know, one is like, oh, that's your home. You should fight for that. And the other, it's like, oh, you just live there. Uh, but people have this connection to the globe. And so their knee jerk response, I've had people call me up on, on radio show things and said, you know, how dare you? How dare you tell me the world isn't what I think it is? Um, I'll, I'll use a, the, the Neo Matrix knee jerk response. And that was, you know, when he first came, when he first was told what the Matrix was, he freaked out, wanted to start punching people and he threw up and passed out. And that's when uh, Morpheus said, look, there's a reason why we don't free people's minds after a certain age. And that is true. I mean, over a certain age, uh, it is really, really tough to get the, the flatter thing across. Whereas when when you get into younger demographics, in fact, the U.gov survey said it all. When they did Americans, they polled um, 
18 to 24 year olds and a third of them full like 34 percent were like going yeah globe not buying it anymore and that and they can't ask anybody below 18 but i'm telling you i've talked to the ones below 18 we skew even higher going going younger uh so it's just conditioning that's all it is hmm. all right. or, or the line let me use the line from the truman show and that is um we believe the world that is presented to us Simply, um, well, let me, I'll give you a quick example. Um, George Orwell, who you probably know of, uh, he wrote in um, an article in 1946. He's not a flat earther, and he wrote this about the responsibility of science. And he goes, you go, he goes it's interesting. You walk up to anybody in the street and you ask them how they know the world is a globe. And their immediate knee-jerk response will be, what are you talking about? We know. It's, you know, use the Game of Thrones things. It is, it is known, right? It is known. It's a given, like, like algebra. Well, and then he pressed them. I was like, well, how do you know? That's really interesting. How did everybody in 1946 know that it was a globe? Because NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. They didn't know. They were told. There's a big difference. If you're told and your father and his father's father going back at least 20 generations, there's nobody, nobody alive, nobody in your family tree that even questioned it. Or why would they? So how, you know, how does everybody know it's a globe? We believe what is presented to us, which is why I use, and again, if you haven't watched the clues, uh, the movie, the M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Village, mm -hmm. which I thought was brilliant in its execution, which is you just take a bunch of kids, put them in a wildlife preserve mm -hmm. and tell them that it's the 1800s mm -hmm. and that you can't go into the forest because there's monsters. They're going to believe every word you say. I mean, yeah. you got to remember, we believe in Santa Claus up until a certain age. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of let it off. Although, find me a news story. Find me any news channel which gives that up. You know, I mean, heck, I, I watched a CNN story two years ago where Wolf Blitzer is talking to a Pentagon correspondent about how Santa Claus is going to be escorted by F-18 fighter jets. <laughs> They're playing it absolutely. I put it on my channel. They're playing it absolutely straight. Nobody's giving it away. And, you know, that's for the kids. It's, it was one step up from all the local news. It's like, well, all the kids should go to bed. We got Santa Claus on the radar. Mm. <laughs> anyway, so what if, yeah, what if there was something out there that you never fessed up to that the kids never, you know, most kids, what, find out when they get to school and somebody older than them, it's like, you still believe in Santa Claus, idiot. <laughs> so, sorry, go ahead. In the round earth. <laughs> <laughs> and, um... So here, one sec. One of the, the computer we had the questions up on initially just died. So we're gonna we're just doing a little adjustment. You're fine. Uh, can you still see us? Yes. See him? Perfect. There we go. Alrighty. Okay. So a question we have is: um, Have you ever uh, converted someone's beliefs um, within just like a single conversation that you've had with them? Um, just about like. You're, you're um, the fastest person I've ever seen do a, um, sorry, I'm exiting out of this. My, my actual auto recording died as soon as you guys hit the, um, as soon as you guys hit the recording on that thing. That's okay. No worries. Um, I, uh, the, the quickest person I've ever seen converted was a, um, a woman down in Pasadena, California. She was an Uber driver. And she was driving one of our members to the event and she comes up to me and she's talking about flat earth and, and, uh, she had questions and I said, well, how long you been in? She goes, well, what time is it now? <laughs> I go, really? And she goes, I go, what had happened was in the 20, 30 minute cat ride from, uh, the one location to the event, our member had thrown so many questions at her. They went back and forth to where she just pulled over, decided she wasn't going to take any more fares. And that was it. She was she was done for the afternoon, and I, I thought that was really amazing. Um, however, most people take about two weeks mm -hmm. uh, to to get through any sort of journey. That's about the average. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a great um, Google programmer who was being interviewed, and he said he, he worked for YouTube. And they asked him how things get recommended. Why do things get recommended to you? In, and, you know, you probably can guess, right? But there's also things that get recommended to you that you don't know about. And he, out of all the topics he could have brought up, there's thousands and thousands of topics on YouTube. And he says, well, if the average person that gets into Flat Earth watches 20 videos in a row, what do you think we're going to recommend? And that was true. We were being recommended to things that were way, I mean, tractor maintenance. It's like, oh, here's four flat earth videos for you. you know, potato salad recipe. You know, it didn't matter. Flat earth just kept getting recommended to people to where it just got 
uh, really ridiculous to where there was a, like a Senate subcommittee where the you know Google higher ups and our government you know had a public meeting on television. I'm watching this and they're discussing you know the flat Earth problem. And I'm going really flat Earth problem. So um, most people, yeah, I think about two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, okay. Although it took me nine months. Some people less. Some people more. I mean. <laughs> Uh, if you're really, some people I, I know have hung on, some of our speakers have hung, hung on for like, six months or longer. Yeah. So one thing that, uh, you know, I've, I've never been able to sort of figure out in, you know, my limited experience with Flat Earth to sort of uh, answer the question, which is sort of how low does this conspiracy go per se? Like, because, you know, you, the, frequently the question is how high does this go? And the answer for this one is necessarily speaking the top. There is no way that this can be maintained unless the very top people in the state, the system, are right. all aware of this. But right. then the question I have is sort of like, you know, does someone who is getting their PhD in astronomy, are they generally aware of the truth? Uh, have no. they been indoctrinated? Nope, 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 nope. No. No. As a matter of fact, this is what this isn't like the Manhattan Project. Mm -hmm. Well, and by that I mean, um, you know, the, where they had facilities around the United States and you know people that were refining uranium for the atomic weapon program, uh, where hundreds of thousands of people knew, but it was compartmentalized. This is so big that it is the ultimate need to know. Meaning, ninety-eight percent of no, no pilots know, no scientists know that. I love people to say, well, you know, every astrophysicist, and there's only like ten thousand of them in the world. Uh, they'd have to know. It's like, no, no, they don't. Um, in fact, you wouldn't want to tell him. Neil deGrasse Tyson, you don't have to tell him anything. In fact, you, it's better to have him acting naturally than to, to tell him because it's a really, it's a heavy, heavy thing to, to drop on people. Mm -hmm. The only people that need to know, and I'm talking about, I mean, if you want to tell like the president of the United States and world leaders, I suppose you could, but you better have a good reason for it. Um, uh, I'll give you a quick example when, um, the, there's a great story and I hope it's true. Um, you know, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was the uh, president, the allied commander during World War II, he became president of the United States shortly afterwards. And the story goes is that Area 51, you know, we all know it's a thing, right? It's a secret military base that's not so secret. You know, it's just behind fences. And, uh, and he was it basically was built without his knowledge. And he calls them up. It's like, hey, can I take a tour? And they literally said, sorry, you don't have clearance. Ouch. Now, eventually they gave him clearance because he goes, look, uh, I have a lot of friends that are still generals and I'll just roll in there with the first army if yeah. you want me to, you know, I'll take a tour that way. But he was the last president with any sort of power. So as far as how low it can go, no, uh, pilots don't know. Although pilots, I've had quite a few pilots from my subject matter list that mm -hmm. say that, oh yeah, there's a bunch of pilots that question it. But they're usually so busy, you know, with their day-to-day -day stuff. Plus, it's like, well, if you're a pilot, who are you going to tell? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Who are you going to go to? You're going to go to the FAA? You're going to go to your airline? <laughs> I mean, if you're a pilot and you even mention the word UFO, it's like, oh, yeah, we were chased for like 120 miles. It's like, you're benched. And that's it. You don't go back. I mean, there was this great Japanese pilot um, back in the, the mid-'80s he was flying cargo, right? He was flying a cargo 747 and he was over Alaska and he was being just chased by this massive thing about the size of multiple aircraft carriers and he could not lose it. And the Air Force base was like, okay, do this, do this. And they were tracking the whole thing on radar. He lands. What do you think he does? He's like, let me tell everybody what I saw. And that was it. He never flew again. <laughs> they put him on a desk back in Japan and that was the, that was the end. You would be better off doing that than telling Flat Earth. You're doing the whole flat earth thing. In fact, there was a, one of our um, subject matter experts, uh, a female pilot for KLM. She uh, she told her doctors, and I know she was messing with them. She wanted to see what they do. And she says, yeah, I believe in flat earth. You know, during one of her, her physical checkups, they say, sorry, we're not letting you up until you recant that whole thing. And she never did. So. Jeez. Wow. Um. Alrighty, uh, we're gonna do some more. Uh, yeah, it's just a little lighter, you know, some lighter. Sure. Uh, okay, so we're kind of interested. What's like yeah. one of the strangest experiences you've had, like in the flat Earth community? Maybe at like a conference or an interview, just like something kind of funny or bizarre. That's yeah, happened. yeah, you yeah. know, I, I got a. Oh, I got so many. Uh, well, I mean, first <laughs> off, ev everything in the flat Earth is weird. All right, you just gotta you gotta understand that everything is so unexpected that uh, it's it's hard for me to even like try to order them but i'll give you two quick ones um one was when i was doing a, a shoot with national geographic 
and we shot for like three days and they used all of 10 minutes and they hated us. Oh, they hated us so much. And we did a, a thing down at the Salton Sea and everybody, le- by the time everybody left, and it was just me and eight camera guys and the you know, producers. It was just, ba- all the other Flat Earth members had left. Um, they had, they, they sat me down. I was so tired. I was up, like, I'd been there like since 5 a.m. and it was like at least after lunch. And they said, okay, what happens when flat earth gets out of your, outside of your control? What happens to medicine? What happens to technology? What happens to science? You know, isn't it, isn't it possible that you could be ushering in the new dark age? I was like, wow, really? I mean, this is National Geographic there. And, and I was, I was really, and they never aired a single word of that. And I was like, oh, okay. I knew what was happening. The reason why they even did this segment is because they were worried. They were said, that, look, science is not putting up any sort of defense against us. And they thought they, they were hoping to raise the alarm bells to, toward, toward science. And I go, yeah, you actually absolutely should. Because, you know, right now, uh, and they've, this has been happening for a year, couple of years now, where science keeps looking at it and they're going, nah, it'll be fine. It's like, they'll go away. They'll go away. It's like, uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, we were just on Newsweek, uh, cover of Newsweek uh, a couple of months ago. And I think, yeah, we're on the cover of Popular Science right now. Literally, we got like an eight-page spread in there where they called me Babyface, which I don't like very much, but that's okay. Um, babyface. We won't kind of <laughs> yeah, babe. Well, seriously, in the article, I mean, I was stunned, uh, and I knew. I, I actually remember. I remember remember meeting the um, the author of that she was an independent journalist. Uh, she met us at the Denver conference. Um, another funny thing would be, oh, I don't know, Logan Paul showing up at the Denver conference and trying to pass himself off as a flat earther. And I knew he was trolling, and I ended up having to give up my spot. Uh, and I mean, I, I left. I got on a plane and flew the hell out of there. I go, I will not be anywhere. I, I didn't think they should have led him anywhere near the place. Uh, because I go, look, he's never done a serious video in his life. And, and you think he's actually coming in as a flat earther? Yeah. I mean, the guy and his idiot brother are they're some of the worst internet trolls ever. Um, yeah, that's... <laughs> two, two more real quick. One was... Um, Uh, Patricia Steer, when she got interviewed by CBS down in Los Angeles at a meetup, that same meetup I was uh, doing National Geographic, we were literally within 30 yards of each other, and they were interviewing her, and they put it on YouTube, and it got like a million hits, doing very well. It was like top of the charts and flat earth, and all of a sudden they pulled it. They pulled it from there. They pulled it from their archives. It was their showcase piece, and the reason was they were fair with us, and... The, I, I knew CBS has an older audience in the United States and as a network. And so I, I, I absolutely knew what happened. There were, you know, some elderly women probably or people that, you know, remember Apollo. Uh, you know, they handwritten letters sent to the producers, the station. And, you know, some guy in a meeting is like, we have handwritten letters. You know, we could <laughs> lose nine members of the Church Muffin Club, for God's sake. <laughs> we got to pull this piece. Um, <laughs> The funniest, the funniest one though was just recently. I was I was at a conference in um, Auckland. I was flying down to Auckland, New Zealand, and this guy who you know it's a long flight, so they're like feeding you and giving you drinks as much as they can to make you comfortable. And this guy's coming around with bread, like just like a big thing of bread. It's like okay, all different types. And he looks at me. He goes, he goes, hey, you want some bread? And I go, no, not really. And he goes, are you sure you don't want any bread? <laughs> he's looking at me i'm going okay fine i have a couple of those little garlic rounds right there and he goes yeah you want those because they're flat and they're round <laughs> and he winks at me <laughs> and i go really he goes he goes yeah man <laughs> and he goes, he goes i gotta go pass out more bread and he leaves <laughs> and it's like holy smokes he was he was one of ours, yeah. There's a line I use, and I know I wish they could have used it in the documentary, but it's from that James such a great James Bond quote, which is uh, when they were um, had the guy from Spectre and they were interrogating him, and he goes, "The first thing you need to know about us is we have people everywhere," <laughs> and uh, th- we do. We have freaking people everywhere. Um, I just did a um, uh, a television commercial down in Australia, and uh, the only reason I did that commercial was because. Uh, somebody there, somebody I, I know full well, somebody in that company or multiple people in that company that hired me were on our team. And they're like, oh yeah, let's, let's get them, let's get them in for this. I mean, it was like, you know, we need you down here in 10 days, shoot a television commercial here. We'll throw money at you. It's like, mm-hmm. okay, sure. Why not? 
so yeah, we have, weird stuff happens to us all the time. It's flat Earth. I mean, I'm I'm for the fact that I'm going to do street activism in Dublin and yeah. Belfast in six days. <laughs> You know, about flat earth. I'm going to go up to the middle of freaking Ireland, which I've never been, you know, the heart of Ireland, and talk on the street about flat earth with a banner behind me and a van that's covered with flat earth propaganda. Oh, yeah. That makes total sense, doesn't it? That's what, that's what we're doing. I mean, that's part of my speech. I say, look, it's 2019. We're talking about flat earth. If you would have come to me five years ago. I'd have been like, you're out of your mind. Yeah. And here we are we're you know I, and i thought that when i put when i made the clues and i put them out there i was convinced that some academic was going to call me up okay and it's like here's where you went wrong you forgot to carry the two it's all you know just shut down your channel go back to your life and instead everybody else started calling me and saying yeah you know what you might be onto something and it just got worse and worse and worse no academic to this date oh i'm sorry here's one more i'll, I'll throw one, one more thing for you real quick uh you may or may not have heard this story and that was um so I had uh, uh, the biggest television network in Germany call me ZF1, and they called me and they said, "Okay, we've got a guy that we were going to get to interview, you know, debate with you, uh, astrophysicist at a Georgetown." I'm like, yeah, good. And he goes, "Okay, but you're not going to talk to him directly. We don't want you talking over each other because scientists are notoriously bad. You know, this monosyllable." You know, they're really, really dry. Yeah, that's and they are, they are. They're terrible, and which is why Bill Nye gets on television all the time. He's he's like he can he looks the part. Most people don't know. He's got a bachelor's in mechanical. That yeah. like, <laughs> think he's like he's, An got, he's Bill Nye, the engineering guy. <laughs> and he's not even that. I mean, he, he got his bachelor's in mechanical, but realized immediately he wanted to be an actor and became got on a comedy acting troupe up in the Northwest. No. Um, so anyway, I'm supposed to debate this guy from Georgetown. And they said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to record you coming up with five talking points, and we're going to videotape that. We're going to send him the talking points. He's going to respond on video, and we're just going to be the go-between. We're just going to keep handing tapes to you guys. And I go, and they go, you start. So I came up with five quick points, which was uh, long-distance photography, vacuum versus gravity, the eclipse shadow, the moon temperature, and the Van Allen radiation belts, and you know, a paragraph on each of those. And threw them at him, and that was it. He folded immediately and that was it he, and then zf1 was bent out of shape and they never ran the segment and we never did anything ever again so and that is you and that's one of the reasons why we just keep moving forward is because it's really really tough oh sorry last one that's i saw you keep thinking of one when i did a debate with an astrophysicist his name was jeff Zwerink, down in los angeles at a at a television thing called the fallen state um Afterwards, the producer grabs me and says, hey, she goes, just so you know, we had to call like all over California to try to find someone to come in. And we called some some people at USC and we got to hold this Asian astrophysicist. And he goes, oh, right on. He goes, can I can I can come on to uh, to talk about flat Earth? And, and she goes, yeah, you're going to go against Mark Sarge. He goes, oh, no, I'm not going against flat Earth. <laughs> I'm, I'm on I'm on board with this thing. And she goes, no, sorry, we can't use you. And I go, oh, man, she, I go, I really want to talk to that guy. So yeah, we got and same thing happened with a radio show when I, I did a radio show thing down in Australia and it was called um, Change My Mind where they had all these people. You you give out you know like a layout. It's like I'm Mark Sargent. This is what I, I want to talk about. And then all the people in the phone lines call up try to change your mind. And afterwards, the producer same sort of thing. She says she goes wow. She goes we had so many calls behind the scenes that were that wanted to talk to you about about flat Earth. And I go you didn't let them through. She goes. Well, that's not controversial. She goes, that's a boring show. She goes, we can't let those people on. We are only going to let on people that hate you. It's like, ah, uh, so anyway. You're fine. What else? The, the second question we wanted to ask in that then is that, um, like, what is the strangest, coolest, most bizarre pieces of flat earth sort of merchandise that you've ever seen? Um, I can show you one. Hang on one second. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Um, one sec. So, I got, yeah, it's this thing right here. <laughs> you know, like this. The, the cool, I mean, I get a lot of stuff. I get your standard stuff. I get t-shirts. I get posters. Uh, there's a clock over. Well, it's not even a clock. It's just a wall hanging flat earth model, which, which backlit with LED. I give a lot of it away. Mm -hmm. uh, I keychains. 
oh, full blown models, you name it. But the coolest thing was this: there was a company out of I don't know if you can see the logo. It's called uh, PowerCoin, uh -huh. but the thing there it's called Great Conspiracies, uh -huh. right? And there's this company out of Italy that called me up and they said, "Hey, we'd like you to, to promote our um, our thing, our, our our model. We're doing a coin. It's like a two ounce silver coin. I'll show you real quick." which is actually, and she goes, it's really unique. She goes, it's, it's, it's actually a flat earth model. So, but it's a, it's actually a two ounce silver coin oh. that they, uh, they turned into a, uh, a flat earth, a domed flat earth structure, you know, went back and, uh, but yeah, that was really, really cool. And it, 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 they, they shipped it from Italy to, to send it to me. I, and I take it with me where I go. Yeah. It's, um, it's an easy way to explain it to people without using a giant model. Yeah. And uh, that's probably the coolest thing I, I've gotten so far. Every, everything else, you know, it's nothing's trademarked. So I do get a lot. I mean, I've gotten so many shirts, but, uh, it, but most of the stuff is, is pretty, pretty standard. Um, every once in a while, I mean, most of the, the, the really weird, weird stuff is like artwork. People will send me just, mo they'll, they'll show me, um, they'll send me uh, snapshots. And I use in the, the slideshow of, of stuff that I do. I get a lot of flat earth artwork. And, of course, the, all the flatter songs that people create. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's also something that makes it really different from everything else is that Flat Earth is not like any other conspiracy. Find me another conspiracy to where people make happy music about. Mm -hmm. Find me a happy folk song about JFK or 9-11 or something like that. It's, I mean, I've got a playlist on my channel with like 200 and something tracks from everything from rap to folk to poetry slam to you know, rock grunge you name it it's all out there and it's like that it inspires people to uh to make this these positive things i was like yeah great fantastic yeah that's cool but anyway it's part of the great conspiracies collection this is like the first one <laughs> so that's awesome <laughs> that's really cool mm -hmm. yeah. all right um our next question here is how's like the relationship between people who believe in the model that you believe and then the other model you discussed is there, is there controversy uh does the or does it's the... it's not it's not that bad um there's always dissension in the ranks no question most of the dissension usually is because of ego though uh and that is you know everybody wants to you know this is uncharted territory for a lot of people so everybody wants to be have the, have their stage time everybody wants to have uh you know they they want to be you know king of the hill um but it's when it comes to the models Again, it's it's the line I used in the the documentary, which is kind of like the Scottish Highlands, whereas yeah, oh yeah, we'll beat each other to death all day long about certain points, but at the end of the day, we all have a common enemy on the other side of the field, which is the globe, and that's where everyone, you know, we luckily we have that common ground. If we didn't have that common ground, we'd be uh, we'd be in really tr real trouble. Uh, but to that effect, if science ever decide to put up an organized defense against us most of the dissension would go away almost immediately because we just don't we don't have a common target neil tyson won't put him after the comedy central thing that he did he never put himself out there again and neither did bill nye or michio kaku or brian cox i mean brian cox didn't even believe it he doesn't even think it's a real thing I meaning he says no oh, no one's ever believed in flat earth it's a myth <laughs> it's like the kraken it's like it was, never was a real thing it's like well actually the kraken was a real thing but we don't get into that um so, no, the dissension about the model, very, very minor. We just agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it, because there's so many other points we agree on. It's kind of like asking somebody, a conspiracy guy, give me your top 20 conspiracies in order of importance. Mm -hmm. You ask any conspiracy guy, all their top 20 lists are going to be different. Mm -hmm. But what they can agree on is everything on the list should be on the list, more yeah. or less. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a big happy. I mean, like the conference that, uh, the conferences I've gone to, they're just giant love fests. Yeah. People, people don't, they, they don't know. It's not like, you know, everyone's whispering in tones. It's like, all right, we got to take over the government. All right. <laughs> get, get, get some gas cans and road flares. Let's burn it all down. You know, we don't do that. It's really, no, it is. It is kind of like a love fest. I mean, people, it's, nobody sleeps. Everybody, I mean, there's a lot of drinking and people are just, it's one big party. Because people are, are are in an area, it's a you know a, the safe space where nobody's judging you. 
I mean, yeah, it's some media might be judging you while they're there, but they're outnumbered a lot. <laughs> and so if you're like a camera guy and it's like, yeah, flat earth, isn't it stupid? You know, all of a sudden you're surrounded like by like a beehive of people. It's like, oh, I got some words for you, man. So yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of like camp. We're like, we're, we're get, we're getting psyched up for the big Dallas conference and I don't know, well, you know, at this point, I, I like have to rent a suite because there's people that, you know, it's again, it's just going to be a big party. Yeah. And so on that same sort of note, um, what was it sort of like within your community to be accused of so directly of being like a government shill by uh, Math Powerland? Well, officially, I can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can neither confirm nor deny gray shirts, Ontario. <laughs> Keep an eye on them. Uh, no, no, Matt, no, Matt, that was all ego, Matt. And, and for anyone that's listening to the audio, that was me putting on a pair of cop sunglasses. Uh, and somebody gave those to me just for that reason. Uh, because I get accused of things a lot, and mostly it's because things have happened pretty easy for me. Most of my stuff that that I've done is unsolicited, meaning uh, you know the radio show and the book deal and the documentary and everything. And people just call me. I don't have to call. I don't even have an agent. People just keep calling me. It's like, hey, you want to do this? Like, sure, let's do this. <laughs> and people don't understand. It's like, why has it happened for you? I go because I put my name and my phone number out there. That's yeah. that's, yeah, that's usually the reason why. And Matt was the same. Oh, Matt. Uh, Matt was Matt blew his window and he knows it. Uh, he uh, although in hindsight it turns out he could have never given it a coherent interview to to begin with. I had no idea. I I actually wanted Matt to take points on this back in the day. Back back four years ago, I <laughs> wanted him to take point, uh, but he didn't. Uh, he was like, no, no, you know, I'm not ready for the media yet. You know, he wanted to make them wait, you know, like like those idiots that like make you wait like 50 minutes for an encore. Uh, he, he wanted, he did. So when people say that, I try, I try to tell them, I go, look, the media is lazy. And that is, uh, when the media want to find somebody, they're not going to look very long. They're going to type in flat earth interview and they're going to look for your contact info. If they don't find it in five minutes, they're going to move on to somebody else. And all they have to do, that's what they did with me, which is they looked at my stuff. It's like, they listened to me, not even probably very long. It's like, oh yeah, he can do a pretty good interview. Let's just use him. Sensible. And that just snowballs to where that's all anyone is like, oh, who's doing most interviews to where now I, other people are, it's tough to get them to. I pointed other people like, go talk to him, talk to him, talk to other people. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to talk to me, but it's like, all right. Uh, apparently the guy, I'll, I'll give you my, my secret. Um, there was a, a writer in um, New Zealand who, who wrote it. And no one else had written this. He goes, he goes, Mark has a goofy warmth that instantly disarms you. And I said, is that true? <laughs> and so I started asking people, I go, goofy warmth? They go, oh yeah, yeah, that's what it is. I go, oh, there you go, I'll take it. <laughs> it's apparently, it's like it's like Bill Murray. I've been accused of that a lot, where, you know, a younger Bill Murray, or Bill, Bill, Bill Murray when he's 50. Mm -hmm. so. Anyway. Mm -hmm. And so sort of a follow up with that is, do you actually believe there are government shills within prominent places in the flat earth community? No, not in flat earth. No, no. Shills are so easy to freaking spot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you don't, you don't need shills. It's not like the black Panthers nowadays, you know, where you literally before the internet. Yeah. You had to insert people into organizations, but with the internet, you can do most of your research online. You don't need to go into the groups. Um, plus the thing with flat earth, um, uh, I'll, two things real fast. One would be if you're in flat earth, if you're a shill, eventually you're going to have to veer off course. And that's going to be really, really evident. I mean, people have been like, oh, Mark's a shill. It's Mark's a shill. It's like, I've been saying the same thing for four years. I go, where, when am I going to reveal my master plan? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, when am I going to, when am I going to do that? Um, it's, it's never, ever happened. Um, so no shills, they, they, uh, there's one thing, in fact, you want to spot a shill. I've warned people about this. I go, I go, if it does happen, I called them the, um, kind of like the flat earth antichrist, mm -hmm. which is you'll know when a shill shows up because what'll happen is you'll see somebody on television that you have no idea where he, who he is and where he came from. Kind of like Obama, <laughs> like Obama became president, but before he ran for president, nobody knew the hell who he was. Right. 
And so people are like, that's why the whole birth certificate thing was out there. They are like, where the hell did he come from? Nobody knew. It's like, oh, yeah, look, he'd be a first black president. Um, the Flyers community is well aware of this. So if all of a sudden shows up on somebody shows up on camera, all of a sudden people would be calling, making phone calls around. It's like, do you know who this guy is? This is John Thompson or whatever his name is? They're like, no, I've never seen it. people. W the Internet's so fast that within a couple hours, there'd be this consensus. Of like, does nobody, you know, where'd this guy come from? So, uh, no, there's no shells in, in the Flyers community. I, I don't know if there were any who they would be. Now, yeah. granted, I will get labeled. I, I won't be labeled a shill when that commercial comes out. It's, uh, with, oh, man, it's, the timing couldn't be worse. Just as the conventions are rolling out, this convention is going to be uh, the, the commercial of me holding the... Um, the cell phones saying, you know, this, this app is so easy. You know, I could do it with my, um, uh, you know, stay on my head. Uh, but people will label me a sellout instead of a shill, which will be kind of weird. Now, if they try to combine the two, you really can't, but I've been accused of so many things simultaneously. They usually cancel each other out. So I'm not worried. <laughs> True. And, um, so, yeah, another thing you kind of mentioned that like, uh, the flat earth, these conventions, they're sort of a bit of a love fest, you know? Yeah. We're kind of like wondering, are, are there like flat earth groupies for, you know, big guys, Mark Sargent and, uh, can you yes. look up? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. No, no, I'll, no, I'll, tell, I'll give you some stuff. It's in my book anyway. Um, the uh -huh. book's coming, book's coming out, I think this weekend. Um, and that is, yeah, you my social. The what? Want us to plug your book that's coming out? Oh yeah. If you want, um, it's called here, let me, uh. <laughs> well, no, here, I'll just drop it in the, uh, one second, I'll drop it in the, did I drop it in there? Hang on. Oh, accept. And now, there it is, right there. Perfect. Got it. So it is, uh, the first book was called Flat Earth Clues, The Sky's the Limit, and this one's called Flat Earth Clues, End of the World. Uh, but yeah, my social life completely changed. Mm -hmm. uh because of flat earth yeah there absolutely are flat earth groupies mm -hmm. um there are there are people first off there's people people that will not date anybody who isn't a flat earth because mm -hmm. there's such a huge paradigm difference you really can't and like if your person's like you know you're an idiot you know i believe in the globe and you know you, you can't you can't do anything um but a quick <laughs> quick story i was well, I'll use the word stalked by a Canadian girl uh, from Victoria who came, she's not pretty, way too young for me. Oh my God, she was 29, six foot blonde. Uh, she literally six feet. And she she shows up at the meetup and then she asked me all, immediately, you know, it's like, hey, how would you like to come up and live in Victoria and make flatters videos? And, you know, I worked, she worked for um, an offshoot of Zynga who, you know, makes, who made um, Farmville. Yeah. You know, that legendary game that did so much damage. Uh, they have an office up in uh, a, a side company up in um, uh, Victoria. But yeah, I, li I lived up there with her for a year. And uh, in fact, every girl that I've dated since then has been flat earth. And yeah, yeah conferences are like that. I mean, part of it, part of it's the, the Hatfield okay. effect. Uh, I won't get into that too much, uh, but uh it happens so i i've gotten kind of gotten to get used to it which is weird because uh, i was a lot cuter when i was in high school but now it's it's all it's all flat earth fame baby yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know the nice thing about flat earth is you know i get older they stay the same age <laughs> oh yeah i i'm impressed that you know that reference the matthew mcconaughey <laughs> dazed and confused like those like those freshman girls, man. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> Sorry, high school. I like those high school girls, man. Yeah. <laughs> he stayed the same age. That that was like one of his first movies ever. Yeah. It, was a, it was a really well-cast movie. I really, really enjoyed it. So, yeah, it's socially, and, and it's the same way with a lot of people. Uh, yeah. Socially, it has been really, really different. And because the energy and the enthusiasm, it really does feel, uh, when you go to these conferences, like camp. You know, some camps, I mean, not, not the camps nowadays, but camps back in the day where kind of like uh, the, the Bill Murray movie Meatballs, where it's just this big social, there's no social pressure at all. Everything go, anything goes. And it's like, yeah, you know, we're just here to have fun. And, and it's this big release for people because it, for a lot of them, it's the first chance for them to be in a, in a, in a totally safe environment.
yeah. where they can't, uh, and I hate to use too many references, but I mean, there's a reason why we say that 90% of our members are in the closet, <laughs> you know? yeah. uh, which is way higher than the gay community. Gay community is only 50%. We're 90%. So yeah. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. I, I resonate with that opinion very well because I work at a summer camp, so I know exactly oh. what you mean by like kind of being in like a community mm -hmm. where you just like no social pressure, just kind of like you feel like comfortable. Yeah. So yeah, mm -hmm. I know. I mean, yeah. yeah, that week that you're there, I mean, it's, you know, you don't have anything that's tying you down. It's, uh, it's different though for adults because, you know, yeah, you're, you're, you're there, with, yeah. it's, you're, you're usually traveling from all parts of the country to get there. And once you're there, you, you're, you just get charged up. You know, it's this big affirmation. I know a lot of people say, well, it turns into like an echo chamber. Well, yeah, it is. It's this giant pep rally. I mean, don't be no difference than a, like a democratic or Republican convention. You know, those things are just, you know, just like, we're the best, we're the best. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, yeah. um, we're, we're, uh, we have a couple more yeah. questions left. Um, okay. We left some good ones for the end that are really interested yeah. um, in your answers. Um, the first one here is, what do you believe is like the number one most compelling argument that the earth is flat? Just the number one. The one that usually, well, I can tell you, it's not, it's not much of a secret. Uh, the one that drags the most people in had nothing to do with the clues that I made. Uh, in fact, I don't even know who the first person that thought of the idea was, and that is long distance photography, okay. which is 10 years ago. Remember, if you, you have to, you have to take NASA and all the space agencies out of the equation. Cause I say, okay, how do you know the earth is, um, and no, you can't use math. I mean, I suppose you could. Uh, but you guys probably would. Um, and that is, that is, I go, if you if you can't use NASA, how would you prove that the Earth is a globe? And there's only two answers you can really give. One is ships going over the horizon and the sticks and shadows argument. Uh, most people don't, don't know the sticks and shadows argument anyway, so let's throw that out for a second. So you got ships going over the horizon. And yeah, 10 years ago, absolutely right. Ships gone. 10 years ago, you got like a $3,000 camera and you're watching it. Ships gone, gone, gone. And the resolution is so terrible, it just becomes blurry and, you're, and it's over. But now that's changed. Uh, the HD technology we have with things like the P, well, now it's the P1000. It used to be the P900, but like the P1000 has a 125 power zoom on it. Ships that used to be gone, now you can br bring back into frame very, very easily. Ships that are long, long gone and at distances that are ridiculous. And when you take, when you take those cameras up to altitude where the atmosphere is much, much thinner, you can see distances that are ridiculously far. And if the curvature of the earth, I remember the average person, we're, we're talking about a war here between for the minds of the general public. The general public doesn't know much about math or physics or engineering, especially electrical engineering. And between those three things, uh, we, we only picked one, which was the curvature of the Earth, eight inches per mile squared. I know you factor in some funky geometry after 500 miles. But we don't care about that because most of the tests are done under 500 miles, which is eight. We didn't come up with eight inches per mile squared. That was you guys. I'm saying <laughs> you guys because it's your group. Yeah, yeah, we're all good. So once, and it takes people a while. I mean, you you go to anyone on the street. I challenge you to do this. I've seen it so many times. Where I go, okay, the curvature of the Earth. I go, do you know what it is? They go, no. I go, it's eight inches per mile. And they're going totally with you. I got it, right? Eight inches per mile squared. And then everybody forgets uh, everything they ever learned in uh, high school algebra. They, it's like, oh, man, I didn't study for that class at all. I'm just glad I got out of it with a D. And what once you plug that in with long-distance long photography, uh, then it becomes a, a picture is worth a thousand words. And that's it. That usually is what grabs people. Because, yeah, it should be gone. It should be gone forever, whatever boat that is going on the horizon. And it's not anymore. And, in fact, I put the challenge out to science. I say, find me an object that, I don't know, 150 miles or less that you can never see, ever, ever. Because, remember, after a while, we, the, the argument is eventually, use the from the movie, something – you should never see something behind the curve. You should never see something on the other side of the curve. Eventually, it's going to be far enough. It is gone. It's on the other side of the hill. And that's not the case anymore. In fact, the only limitation we have now with the new cameras is the thickness of the atmosphere. And I, I still, to this day, I mean, you can listen to any of my email shows or any of the radio stuff I've done. People – I one out of every 20 people, I think, will ask me. It's like, why can't we see Japan from California? And why can't we see Europe from New York? In fact, why can't we see Mount Everest from everywhere? 
And I go, because of the thickness of the atmosphere. That's mm -hmm. the, the big one. I go, you got to remember that if you're diving on a beautiful summer day at high noon, even at 200 feet, you can't see the sun anymore. It's gone because the sun cannot penetrate. I go, the only difference between that and what we're breathing now is just the thickness of it. You know, you're breathing in basically a, a thin version of water. We're, we're just kind of wave. It's mostly transparent, but it gets thicker at, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, and 40 miles. So, sorry, long answer short, long distance of photography brings in more than anyone else. Um, but you know what the second biggest thing is? I hate to, I hate to use this, and, and feel free to cut it out if you want. Uh, the second biggest thing would probably be the biblical side, mm -hmm. which is, and that is, the especially in the Christian community. I, the other four religious houses, we won't get into them that much, but the Christian community really has an edge, and that is there have been some Bible literalists, a lot of them, who've looked at it and said, yeah, the Bible's a flat earth book. In fact, there's only one verse that even touches on a spherical. And it just says, he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth. And circle is not ball, it's not globe, it's not sphere. It's circle, like a dinner plate. Yeah. So that ropes in at least half of the community, at least half are strong, strong Christians, mm -hmm. which makes the conferences interesting. Yeah. Because there's, you know, you want, in fact, there's the criticism every year in the conferences, and remember, we've only done two American, two Canadian, some Europeans and stuff, and that is half the people say it should be more religious and half the people say it should be less religious. And it's it's yeah. interesting huh. because the, uh, the, the organizer of the conference is very, very strong, a strong spiritual religious Christian guy. And so he's got this weird balancing act he's got to do. But yeah, that'd be the top two. And then after that, you know, you take your pick. Gravity versus vacuum of space, eclipse shadow, moon temperature, Van Allen radiation belts, everything that NASA's ever done ever. You just go on and on and on. I mean, there's so many fun things we could go into. And so I suppose, like, to, to close out our interview, because we're writing a publication that goes out to, you know, university students and a lot of, and so generally a more educated population, but not necessarily one that has a lot of resources at hand. Yeah. And probably one that's going in immediately very skeptical to everything you have to say. Sure. What would be one thing that you would have them sort of, what's something they could observe pretty directly without having to buy like a, you know, a super fancy camera or really trust you that, or anyway, what would you suggest they sort of try and look at like, or be aware of to make them so that they're willing to then put in those effort and start to have enough faith to actually go in and look at the community more seriously? Okay, if you're not going to buy a camera, uh, first off, I mean, even though it sounds like a cop-out, I'd have them start doing research online, uh, mm -hmm. even though they're going to get mired down in a lot of YouTube videos, and there's going to be a lot of critique, criticism there, and that is, well, you can't just base everything off of YouTube videos, mm -hmm. for God's sakes, uh, and that's true. I mean, what I, what I try to tell people is, like, trust everyone, but count your change, but mm -hmm. more than that, do your own research and ask questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, don't take anything at face value entirely. Um, the perfect example would be, uh, you know, uh, there was a wonderful quote, which is so arrogant, by Neil Tyson, who he said that science is true whether or not you believe in it. And I said, okay, that's <laughs> fine when you come to, like, telling me what the boiling temperature of water is at sea level. Hmm. But then you go and tell me what the core of the, the, core of the Earth looks like. You know, mm -hmm. supposedly 4,000 miles down, even though the deepest hole ever drilled is eight miles. Mm -hmm. But you show me these wonderful cross sections. And then in the fine print and wiki, you say, we have no idea what's down there. It's like, well, why don't you put that in the diagrams? Well, because science will never put the earth with a giant question mark in the inside of it. They just won't. That's just not what they do. So uh, if I was going to do a test, if you wanted to like a, have them do a physical test, I'd do do the research online. That's that's the first thing. There's uh, just a wealth of content out there, you know, for and against and, and make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do something fun that's cheap and you don't buy a camera, mm -hmm. uh, you can't borrow a camera from somebody, do the moon temperature test. Yeah. If you get if you get a chance, you know, which is go down to a hardware store, pay mm -hmm. 15, 20 bucks for a point and click infrared thermometer mm -hmm. and test the moonlight versus the moonshade. 
and okay. again, compare it with some of the online videos that we've made. I've done it myself. And I, I even thought, I'll tell you how much judgmental we are. I was into Flat Earth nine months and somebody told me this. And I said, you're out of your mind. And remember, I'm into Flat Earth and I'm telling them this. I'm going, the moon is cold. Like it generates a cold laser. I didn't. I didn't even know a cold laser exists, and it does. I didn't know that research labs you can actually change the frequency of a laser and make it cold. Not like a Mister Freeze Batman ray type of thing, but cold, colder. And I. But I was the first one to suggest. I go. What if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight? Does it even get colder? And it's like, yeah, it even gets colder than that. Um, it shouldn't be. It's the exact. It's the opposite of sunlight. Yeah. Meaning it's 50 degrees in the, the moonlight, but it's 60 degrees in the moon shape. We can see up to like 13 degree Fahrenheit swings. And I've seen it myself. It it's, doesn't make any sense. Does this prove flat Earth? No, it does not. Does this absolutely wipe out the relationship between the sun and the moon? Yes, it does. Yeah. So that would be the that'd be the first thing to look at. In fact, one more thing. I'll I'll give you I'll give you a little treat. Mm -hmm. some <laughs> some you can you can give your people. It's part of my speech. Mm -hmm. And it's a single snapshot right about there. Oop, right about there. Mm -hmm. Come on, pop up. There it is. There so it is. that's just a random shot by Apollo 12 mm -hmm. that was taken in 1969. Mm -hmm. like, like the second or third trip to the moon in less than a year, which is rid ridiculously ambitious. Mm -hmm. um, how many things do you see wrong with this image? And it's a trick question because you shouldn't see anything wrong with that image because it's an authentic NASA photo. And yet, uh, from a physics standpoint and an electrical engineering standpoint, there are multiple things wrong with it. It is, first off, it's a beautiful shot. It's perfect in almost every way. It was like it was shot by a magazine department that just happened to you know, take, take shots. Yeah. Uh, forget it. And we're, we'll get rid of the obvious real quick. And I'm looking to end the interview on this. This is what something, this is one of the icebreakers I do during my speeches, which is I'll give rid of the obvious, which is of course, no stars in the background. You'll say, well, it's an exposure setting for the camera. It's like, fine. I go, you're not going to set at least one roll of film on the correct exposure setting. You're just going to all, it's always going to be entirely black. Every photo, every video, every taken from every space agency is always going to be entirely black. Of course, it's going to be black. And mm -hmm. That is because what you see on the bottom there in that white strip, which is the time date stamp. The time date stamp, which is in hours and minutes, is on every photo because they have to document everything. Well, if the belt of Orion is in the wrong place when that stamp is, because remember, a nerd, no, not picking on you guys, I'm a super geek. <laughs> Uh, but if a nerd figures out at three in the morning in his underwear, Nebraska, the belt of Orion should not be in that shot. And then it happens more than once. It's going to be a real, real problem. Uh, I don't know. How about the shadows? The shadows should be in one direction. There's only one light source. And yet there are multiple directions in this. It can only happen one of two ways. Either there's multiple light sources or the directional light source in this case is very, very close. Like, I don't know, a studio spotlight, maybe 30 yards behind them, maybe. The VHF transmitter that is pointing towards Earth has a range with the battery power. Remember, this is 1969. We didn't even have Duracell back then. 1969 maybe has a range of 50 miles, maybe on a good day. And if that, you're only going to be able to send out Morse code. And yet they were shooting 10 frames per second color video and two-way communications with pinpoint accuracy, no snow and no break in the action. Not a chance in hell. There is an electrical engineer that would ever agree. Yeah. Uh, if you if you zoom in on the uh, the capsule, it looks like it was made by a homeless tweaker. Uh, it's, <laughs> you can practically see the curtain rods and paper mache. I don't know how they got away with that. Not to mention the thrust. Remember, they landed on ash, and that is a ten thousand pound thrust engine, and there's no splay pattern at all, at all anywhere. There's no splay pattern. Uh, I don't know. How about how about one more? Let's do. Um, the spacesuit, which I love so much, which is the spacesuit violates thermodynamics, which is pressure needs a container. And that is, means why isn't a spacesuit a basketball? A basketball has layers. Uh, when you have a hard container, like a can of spray paint or hairspray, it says contents under pressure. The pressure presses against the outside. Well, in a vacuum force like this, that spacesuit should turn into a parade float. They should have no articulation points. They should not be able to bend their arms or legs. It should be, they just be walking. It should be like the Christmas story. I can't put my arms down. Should not, it should not ever happen. Their hands should turn into oven mitts and it never, ever happens. And they say, oh no, it's because of special layers. I go, no, my winter coat has layers that just stops the cold. 
The, the, in fact, the early suits, uh, let me end on this. The, the early suits that they tested, you can look this up all day long, were done with hard plastics and metals because they knew this. And then at some point, some genius said, you know what? The general public knows nothing about physics, especially thermodynamics. Let's just use a soft suit. We'll shoot it. No one will know. We'll just go with it. And they did. Perfect. And it is, and it is one of the flaws of our civilization, which is if you see it on television and it's on the news, it's absolutely true. And nobody would ever fake anything like that ever. And it's like, yeah, well, eh, conspiracies happen in business and politics and sports and entertainment and journalism and science from time to time. So there you go. How's that? That's phenomenal. That moon example with the, the, the radiation to throw on, that's the perfect kind of like, uh, you know, something someone can look into to start getting to this, uh, you know, I know. Oh, yeah. About that example but that's a, a perfect one we'll definitely yep. uh supply instructions on how to do that and like uh what oh yeah and there's there's video i can send you links uh there's some okay. wonderful experiments uh not just the point and click there were guys that have done it in glasses of water with copper strips uh one in moonshade one in moonlight and then one with magnified moonlight with like a jeweler's uh holding a magnifying glass onto the strip and i'll be damned it wasn't perfect every time yeah. Again, it's creepy stuff, but what that says is the moon is self-illuminating, mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with the sun. It's just, they're just freaking lights in the sky. Mm -hmm. so, remember, the world is what we are presented, mm -hmm. and, you know, we got to figure it out for ourselves. Yeah. Anything all right, else? All, right. all of our questions. That's all that we have prepared. Yay. Okay. Yeah. Interview is amazing talking to you. Yeah, pleasure. Um, oh really no, like... it was it was my pleasure. I'm glad you guys saw the documentary. Um, how did you how did you run into it? By the way, I'm curious how the chain got to you guys. Well, like a friend of mine told me about it. Yeah, and she I... was really excited about it. Um, so she just told me to watch yeah. it. It was just recommended in yeah. my uh, feed, and I was like, oh, that sounds interesting, and I watched it and enjoyed it. I I am amazed how many younger people have. Uh, remember, I'm older. Uh, how many younger people have gotten into this? Meaning, uh, by word of mouth, you know, it, I part, I, of course, most of it's Netflix. It's like, dude, you got to check this out with it. It's either these guys yeah, are yeah. completely out there or, you know what, this is like freaking me out, man. You know, cause yeah. people that, you know, I, I can't even imagine like, like doing weed or, or drinking and then pulling that up, <laughs> on TV, you know, it's like, what is happening? You know? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. All right. Yeah. Anything else I can do for you? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. We were going to plan on like sending a copy of what we're going to print in the newspaper to you beforehand. Okay. Um, we really want to present it as fairly as possible. I hope that this interview uh, has felt that way to you. No, no, you guys, you guys are great, and don't don't worry about it too much. As far as look, just go. Don't. Don't give an opinion that isn't your own. Don't don't mm -hmm. bow at a public pressure. And it's like, look, you want to take shots? I mean, take shots. I know it's 2019 and nobody's supposed to pick on anybody anymore. Uh, but feel free. You know, I've, I've heard it all before. If, whatever your opinion is, just be as honest as you can to yourself. And would you like us to send you a few copies of the newspaper after it's printed? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, here, if you I'll send me your address, I will uh, <laughs> we'll snag a few copies and send them your way. Hang on. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Right, right. The um yeah. By the way, the uh, the Langley in my address doesn't help me at all because you know the head of CIA headquarters. Yeah. yeah it's head of C yeah. CIA <laughs> headquarters is Langley, Virginia, which is VA, and mine is Langley, <laughs> WA. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's not suspicious at all. We, yeah. we commented on that actually upon calling you up. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh man, that that's uh, that's funny. <laughs> oh no, I, I am sure that I do not get nearly as many phone calls because of that when they on yeah. Skype because they punch it up. It's like Langley. Oh yeah, I'm not calling that number. You know, oh, black helicopters here within the hour. <laughs> so no, no, no. I'm I'm up in the I'm in fact the complete opposite end. I might as well be in Canada. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And if you need anything else, feel free to shoot me an email or drop me a line here, and I'll, I can get you whatever you need. All right, sounds great. Thanks All so right. much. Thank you so much. Hey guys. Bye. Bye bye.